Good morning. Happy Monday, everyone. Praise the Lord. He has blessed us with another day. He's given us another opportunity to trust in Him, to seek His face, and to follow as He leads us unto righteousness doing what is right in his sight, being obedient to his word, and receiving the love and blessings that he has for us, his creations. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning knowing that we are not worthy, but because of your goodness and your mercy, you provided for us salvation through your son Jesus Christ we thank you Father we thank you for our salvation we thank you for reconciling us unto you and calling us your children thank you dear God thank you for choosing us and giving us the opportunity to walk in faith with you knowing that you have defeated sin and death and nothing can destroy us. We will be with you in eternity and we await your coming again, dear Jesus Christ, so that we might see you as you are and fellowship with you as your children forever. Thank you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. Amen. So we continue our study this week uh, on more women in the Bible. Uh, this week's study is on Dorcas, Lydia, and Phoebe. This morning's daily devotional is titled, God Ordained Helper for Man. That's from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 18 through 25, which says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he, f and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and close up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, Shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh? And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. God had a plan to provide for man a help me someone to come alongside him to complete him and that's what the marriage uh, covenant is a complete circle man and his wife very precious it's designed by God and it's perfect we should respect our help needs Okay, faithful servants, Dorca, Lydia, and Phoebe. The central truth of this lesson is that godly women are in, integral to the health and ministry of the church. The focus 
is to affirm the effective ministry of godly women in the church and honor their contributions to the kingdom of God. The evangelism emphasis is the intercession of godly women is effective in winning the lost. The golden text says, A woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And that's from the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 30. Surveys indicate 60% of church attendees are women. A Pew research found Christian women to be more devout than their male counterparts. This isn't to say all Christian men are less committed and involved than women in the church, but it does reflect a greater level of ministering by godly women in church ministries. Countless congregations of all denominations would struggle greatly if it were not for women's groups. In some smaller churches, women's ongoing fundraising efforts frequently have often made the difference between being financially stable or struggling to survive. This lesson, based on three examples of godly women, takes us in a different direction than what has been covered in the previous studies. Rather than studying individuals in their roles in the big picture of God's initiating the human race and bringing about redemption, this lesson provides brief views of three godly women who contributed to the ministry of the church within their communities. Within a total of 25 verses, the scriptures provide a bird's eye view of the ministry of three godly women in the New Testament. Being included not only honors them, but also provides examples of ministry outside the boxes of preaching and teaching. Their lives point to the importance of godly women impacting the overall health and ministry of local churches. The kingdom of God needs women who are skilled in areas frequently not associated with the abilities of men. Also, we have the obligation to recognize all the ministry women carry on carry out in the body of Christ. Let me read that again. Also, we have the obligation to recognize all the ministries women carry out in the body of Christ. All right, section one, Dorcas, faithful and healed, full of good works. Acts chapter nine, verses 36 through 38. Now there was at Joppa, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by inter interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and aims or alms deeds which she did and it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died whom when they had washed they laid her in an upper chamber and for as much as Lydia was nigh to Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. This first section of our lesson focuses on the godly women who lived and served in the city of Joppa, located on the west side of Palestine with access to the Mediterranean Sea. It served as the seaport for Jerusalem. Joppa was about 35 miles from Jerusalem and 10 miles northeast of Lydda. This ancient walled city stood on a 116 foot tall rocky ledge. The seaport provided some difficulties for ships arriving and leaving due to large rocks. 
when Jonah fled from his assignment to Nineveh, he went to Joppa and secured passage to Tarsus. Today, the city of Joppa, located at this site, after indicating the geographic location, verse 36, introduces Dorca as a certain disciple. This description goes far beyond being a distant follower. By definition, it speaks of an individual who, in mind and life, accepts the practices and principles of a specific teacher. In the case of Dorca, this indicates she adhered to the teachings of Jesus. As was common, she was known by two names one in Greek and one in Aramaic. Dorka meaning or means gazelle. Tabitha means doe. Her ministry considered consisted of being a caregiver giver to the poor and needy. This wasn't just an occasional activity but a lifestyle. She was always doing good. This ended when she was stricken with an illness, which resulted in her death. Friends washed her body and then placed it in an upper room. It was normal to wrap the body in wide bands of cloth, give, giving the appearance of a mummy. In death, a person resembled how they were wrapped at birth. Normally, burial took place within 24 hours. In the case of the rebellious Ananias and Sapphira, their bodies were buried immediately after death. If there were some reason to delay burial, it could last up to three days. In these cases, a considerable amount of burial spices would need to be used to cut down the smell of a decaying body in a warm climate. Hearing of Peter's being in the nearby city of Lydia, they sent messengers requesting him to immediately come to Joppa. The death of Dorca was a crisis to them in terms of her ministry and her personal impact on the believers. Sending two men with an urgent message is also seen in 8.14 when Peter and John were sent to Samaria to see the reality of Samaritans accepting the gospel as preached to them by Philip. Likely the believers had heard of the miraculous healing of the paralyzed man in Lydia through the ministry of Peter. That's in Acts 9, verses 32 through 35. After being bedridden for eight years, this man was restored to health as Peter told him, Get up and roll up your mat. As a result of Arenas or Arnius healing, individuals in two cities began to believe in the Lord. All right, section 1b Resurrected Witness. Acts chapter 9, verses 39 through 43. It says, Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the women stood by weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorca made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and knelt down and prayed. And turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Without delay, Peter went with the messengers to Joppa. Upon arriving, he was taken to the room 
where they had laid Dorcas' body. There he found the grieving widows who had benefited from her benevolence. As part of their grief process, they displayed the many products of her handiwork, various articles of clothing. Besides food and shelter, clothing is the next important basic to any person. Peter sending the mourners out of the room seems unusual, but this was time for him to be the means of God's intervention. Something similar can be seen in other biblical examples. Elijah took a widow's dead son to an upper room and then became the vessel through which life was revived. And that's in 1 Kings 17, 22. Elijah did something similar in resurrecting a couple's son, shutting the door so he was alone with the boy's body. And that's in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 33 and 34. Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead only after having the crowd put outside the house. And that was in Matthew 9, 25. Kneeling and facing the body, Peter prayed. The content, the content of it is not shared in Scripture. Upon completion of the prayer, he simply said, Tabitha, arise. The raising of a deceased person continues to be a rare miracle, not something for which we should commonly pray. However, the number of times occurring in Scripture seems to indicate it might be in God's choice in particular situations. During the Indonesian revival of the early 1970s, some individuals were resurrected from the dead. Food was multiplied and individuals were healed from lethal poisoning. After helping Dorca to stand, Peter called for the believers who had been waiting outside the room. She, whom they grieved as dead, was presented to them alive and well. There's an insert here titled, God's Resources. It says, Seek the Lord. He longs to open his resources to you. That was written by Corey Ten Boom. God is all powerful. He can do anything that he desires. He is the creator of all that exists and in control of all things. God is also a loving and merciful father. And he desires to give good things to his children. But so resurrection from the dead is, is one of the gifts that God gives. He doesn't do it in all situations. It's a special circumstance. But to display his power to his people, to help in spreading the gospel, I believe God as many times were resurrected from the dead, and like in, he did in Indonesia, multiplied food, um, cured people from poisoning. He's done miraculous things to spread the gospel, to save more souls, to demonstrate his power, to create faith. God's working in your life. He desires to give you what is best for you. Pray and believe and stand on the word of God that's our reasonable task to trust in God and believe that he will do what is good for you I trust God I wait on his answer after praying it's not easy Doubt creeps in sometimes, but I know if I'm diligent and 
seeking his face and obeying him that he is working in my life to give me what is best for me and my family. And so I trust him. And I pray that you trust God this day in a way that allows him free reign to work in your life. Thank you for your time. Have a wonderful Monday. God bless you.